Hello, everyone. Welcome to another She Clicks webinar. Uh, today, I'm delighted that we're able to stream live to Facebook. It's never a particularly reliable service, but it's happening today, so that's great news. Now, before we start, I just want to remind everybody that this She Clicks webinar is sponsored by Nikon UK, one of the leaders in digital imaging, precision optics, and photo and video capture technologies. Nikon continues to support its own community and beyond with inspiring content from co talented female photographers from across the spectrum. For more information, visit nikon.co.uk. So thank you for Nikon for supporting SheClicks and supporting this webinar in particular. Today we're going to be hearing from Donna Krauss, who is a talented blogger and food photographer, and she's somebody I've been following for quite some time now on Instagram, and I just love her photography. Donna's going to talk, um, and she'll stop a couple of times for questions and she'll also take questions at the end. If you'd like to ask a question, you should see an icon, this is on Zoom, to uh, raise a hand, uh, you know, so it looked like you've raised a hand and I can make you audible so that you can ask your question in person. Or if you prefer, you could type your question into the Q&A box and then I can read that question to uh, Donna at a, an appropriate point. If you're on Facebook, feel free to type a question as um, a comment and I will also relay that to Donna. So Donna, hello, welcome to She Clicks. Hi Angela, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I really love this group. I'm Great. always on Thank Facebook, you. always following everybody, and I just love all the work that everybody puts out there. So really privileged to be here tonight. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, as I say, I've been following your photography for quite some time now, and, uh, you know, it's, it's really stunning. And I know you've had some good success oh, with you. the Pink Lady Food Photography Awards, which um, is a favorite award of mine, um, although it does make me very hungry being involved <laughs> with it. Yeah, I think all aspects of food photography does make you hungry. So I hope everybody's eaten tonight before they started to, before they settled down to watch this, or maybe we'll just inspire them to go and do some nice cooking afterwards. <laughs> okay, well, over to you. Good. Well, thank you. Like I said, I'm really privileged to be here tonight and to be talking to everybody. And I um, just really love the fact that everybody's so interested in learning about food photography. So I'm going to go and share my screen and we're gonna get right into it. So, as Angela's already introduced me, I'm Donna Krauss. I am a professional food photographer and stylist. My, um, I started food photography based off my blog, which was called 8020 Nutrition. Unfortunately, I've been so busy with food photography lately that I haven't actually added much to my blog. Um, so my blog has had to take a little bit of a side seat for a while. Um, but I am getting back to that and I will start to, to add more recipes to it, um, probably hopefully within this year. As Angela mentioned, um, my career basically started with Pink Lady Food Photographer Awards. I submitted a couple of images uh, about four years ago. I ended up being placed, um, uh, placed third in my category and pretty much from there, uh, a career was formed. Um, one of the best decisions I ever made, most terrifying but best decisions I ever made. Um, I do a lot of work for Page Street Publishers. They're based in Boston in the USA. I will receive a manuscript from an author. I will then cook, shop, style, photograph, and send them back a complete, um, a complete visual part of their book. I do a lot of work for Nikon School of Photography. I run, um, I run talks and uh, workshops with Nikon School of Photography. And um, yeah, if you head to the, any of the Nikon pages, you'll, pretty, you'll probably find something that I've been booked for. Um, I am a Rotolight Master of Light. I mainly work with natural light, but I do use Rotolight um, as full light on gloomy days. Like for instance, today I would have used a Rotolight if I was shooting. And then I am a member of Godalming Photographic Club. And I hope that I know that there are some ladies in our, from my club who are part of this, uh, this group. So I hope that some of you are here tonight. It would be really lovely to know that you are, are here. Anyway, so just, just so that you know, this is where I started. I am self-taught. I have, when I started photography, I didn't go to um, university and study photography. It's all just self-taught, practice, feeling, getting a feeling for my camera and learning um, about styling and composition. So my, this is how my Instagram account first started. Um, I had a raisin muffin, which, which I was very proud of. And you can see, if any of you know my work, you know that I have a passion for motion or for pouring shots. And that was my first attempt of, uh, at a pouring shot. But um, 
you know, in when I started that in 2014, I was really proud of these pictures, actually. I had about three followers, but they all liked the pictures, and that was pretty much a start for me. So, um, okay, so let's get into our food photography basics. Camera angles. So when you, we obviously have to cover the basics before we can get into the fun things, but um, camera angles for food are really, really important. Depending on the type of food that you are shooting really depends on the camera angle that you should be shooting from. So if you are, for instance, shooting a pizza, you want to do it from the top down. You need, you need to have the pizza on what we call a flat lay, lying flat and um, your camera overhead so you're shooting directly straight down on top of it. So as you can see exactly what's happening with all the toppings and all the, the different um, um, bases and everything that's happening. Um, again, if you're shooting, say, for instance, a tart with a beautiful lattice design or a pie even, a top-down overhead um, is probably the angle to go, uh, to go at. I'm going to go into straight on because that's the other really um, important angle to work with. And that is generally used for... Something where you, like for instance, a hamburger or a, something with layers and that you really want to highlight those different layers and those different colors or different shapes um, as if you were looking straight at it. So, um, you know, less focus on the top and more focus on the side. And then you've got the 45 degree angle. And that's also a really popular one. If you're trying to show a little bit of the top and a little bit of the side, you're trying to come at an angle. Um, it's a really, it's 45 to 60 degrees angle. Um, it's really popular apparently from a psychological point of view. It's the kind of way that you would approach a dinner table. Um, it's the way that you would naturally see food if you were walking up to a table. So those are pretty much the three angles um, that I work with. I, I personally don't do a lot of flat lay um, because I'm just not really that as comfortable with it as I am um, with the other angles. But um, yeah, and you know, if you don't know which angle you want to um, you want to shoot at, it's digital. You can shoot them all, and you can decide at a later point. But it really is important to get to establish your your angle of of shooting before you've even started to consider building your set. So these are some um, examples that I have of angles. So we have an overhead or flat lay with the apples, the 45 degrees where you can see a little bit of the, the side and you can actually see what's going on on the top. And then a straight on showing the different, um, the different divisions and the different lines and the pancakes. So we'll get into aperture. I'm just briefly gonna to touch on these because obviously we don't have that much time and um, you know we could, we could spend hours on camera settings. But basically, if you're, shooting a, if you're shooting straight on, I prefer to use a lower f-stop. So I prefer to use something around f3, f3.5, depending on the lens that you're using. Sometimes you can go a little bit lower. I wouldn't go as low, wouldn't go anything lower than f2 probably. So play around in that area. And because of that, because of a, because of a lower f-stop, you get that beautiful, soft, romantic feeling with the depth of field in the background. And it just highlights your hero of that you're trying to show, and then it pushes your background back and creates a really soft, beautiful feeling. Um, if you're shooting overhead or you're shooting a flat lay, uh, you would need to use a higher f-stop. So anything starting from f5.6, you want as much of your image in focus as possible. You don't want to have um, any depth of field happening in, in the picture, in the flat lay. It can feel very uncomfortable if you're looking at it. And um, it, yeah, it's just, it's best to have as much of that in focus as possible. But if you are working for a client, you do need to confirm their preference because a lot of clients don't like um, a shallow depth of field. Um, if I'm working for my publishers, they prefer as much in focus as possible. So if I'm doing a straight on, my publishers um, prefer the images to be as, as in focus as possible. So always confirm if you are working with a client. I mean, obviously, if it's your personal preference, you can do what you want, you know, and how you want it. Right. So let's get into some shutter speed here. So a fast shutter speed freezes the motion which as you can see, I love my motion shots. So you need to ensure that you have a faster shutter speed to be able to do that. A slower shutter speed can be used on dark and overcast days. So for instance, today, because um, that allows uh, more light into the sensor. But you have to be careful with that because if you slow down your shutter speed, you're going to have, um, you're going to have blur. You're not going to have a crisp, sharp image. So you need to ensure that your ISO is slightly higher 
Um, I don't really get into ISO talks too much, um, but I'll, I'll, okay, I'll chat about that. Let me just finish this. Um, and always use a tripod if you're doing a slow, if you are, if you do have a slow shutter speed to ensure that you have a, a sharp picture. But just getting back to the ISO, there is a there is a belief in the food photography world that everything has to be shot at 100 ISO. Now I use a Nikon camera and um, I don't believe, and I know that Nikon can handle a much higher ISO than than 100. So if I'm shooting um, if I'm shooting for myself, so for instance, this uh, flower shot was done at 2,000 ISO. You know. Um, I, I think if you are shooting for publications, you need to double check with them if they do have an ISO requirement. Most of the publications I've shot for do not have an ISO requirement, um, but just always just double check. And if you are learning, bump your ISO up and so that you can have a faster shutter speed and you're able to capture that motion beautifully. So just a few camera change, camera setting game changes that I've discovered in, in my, in my um, photography time. So working in, in manual mode really gives you so much more control. Um, display the exposure meter in the, in the viewfinder for a well-exposed image. Um, the, view, the exposure meter is that little, um, if, you're looking through your camera, if you're looking through your camera viewfinder, you'll see at the bottom, there's, it looks almost like a little seesaw with little lines across it, and it goes into neg negative and positive. And um, once, you, once you start to understand how your exposure work, meter works, um, there's a very, a very good chance you won't ever have a badly exposed image. Um, shooting in RAW makes editing at the end so much easier. Makes allows you to bring out your darks and, and lower your, your lights if you do have exposure issues. Um, <coughs> sorry. Turn on auto white balance. Um, it's a pretty controlled environment so that you'll be shooting in. So auto white balance is absolutely perfect. Uh, turn on grid lines, and I think this is actually quite important for any type of photography. So turn on grid lines, so when you're looking through your viewfinder, you can actually get that perfect horizontal line. Um, there's nothing worse than a table that's sloping a little bit, so it looks like the food is starting to slide off. So horizontal lines are really, really perfect, perfectly straight horizontal lines are really, really important. Um, Never shoot handheld with a shutter speed less than 1 25th of a second. That's um, as I was talking earlier. A slow shutter speed um, won't capture that beautiful crisp sharpness. It'll just look, um, particularly in a, in a motion shot, it'll look quite blurry. Um, and then when you are doing an overhead shot, if you're doing a flat lay, I always put my camera onto live view. Um, if I, my, DSL, um, my DSLR, I put onto live view, uh, just so that I can see exactly what's happening with my overhead shot. And then um, a little spirit level for the overhead shots is always quite handy, uh, just to make sure that your camera is um, sitting in the tripod correctly and it's nice and level um, on both the horizontal and the vertical aspect. So camera lenses that I use, um, so for food photography, because it's a pretty controlled environment, you don't need to use a zoom lens. Of course, if you have a kit lens or you have camera or you have other lenses that you, you know, I'm not expecting you to go out and buy any lenses, but these are just generally recommended for food photography. So your basic entry level, um, pretty much straight out of the starting blocks is a 50 millimeter F1.8 uh, fixed lens. And um, nothing more than that. You don't need an F1.4. Um, there's very seldom a need to shoot at um, anything lower than F2. So an F1.8 is absolutely, absolutely all you need. Um, I shoot regularly with my 85 millimeter. Um, most of my books that I shoot are generally with 85 millimeter. And then I have the 105 macro, which is the F2.8, which um, I do a lot of close up work with as well. Um, but generally those are the three lenses that I use. And then if I'm on location, I'll take the 2470, uh, just because it just makes, um, just everything so much easier than having to swap and change, uh, lenses during, um, during a, a, a food shoot. And also I find that if I am changing lenses quite a lot, especially in the foodie environment, um, I do run the risk of, um, getting my lenses dirty and greasy. So I try and avoid, um, changing my lenses that too much. So these are some examples of the different lenses that, um, I, that I use. So I'll use a 50 millimeter for an overhead shot mainly because I want quite a large area. I want to try and get as much into the, into the um, flat lay as possible. A very tightly cropped flat lay um, is, is, 
is not really ideal. I think you, I feel you need more space in a flat lay. You need to give it, give it a more, give it a feeling of um, extra area and extra space. So yeah, definitely. i generally most of the time I'll use the 50 millimeter for for an overhead. Um, 85 millimeter, as I said, I just find that a beautiful portrait portraiture um, lens, and it's just pretty much my go-to lens for portrait for food portraiture. Then um, the 105 macro, you can use at varying distances from the subject. So you can get in really close and do a beautiful macro shot. Um, I love the bokeh on the 105. Um, and then if I pull it far back, I can get a beautiful telus um, compression um, in, in a further, in a distance image. Um, the one thing about that though, is that you do need to ensure that you have the surface space, you have the room area. I know a lot of people have bought um, 105s and then they found that they can't get um, distance enough, they can't get enough distance from their subject. So just do be aware of that. that wherever you're shooting, just ensure that you have enough space to, to pull back further. Um, right, so now we've got, so now we've done the basics in terms of our um, camera. So we're gonna go into some props and backgrounds. Um, styling can be kept simple just with a rustic, textured or weathered backboard. Um, so you don't really need to have too many styling skills when you're starting out. If you can get yourself a couple of backgrounds that have a, a rustic or textured um, appearance to them, they pretty much speak for themselves. You can put, you can put a plate down on it. Um, you can put a, a tart down on it, um, put a couple of flowers around it and a really beautiful textured background really just enhances the, the, the whole setup really nicely. Um, Avoid shiny surfaces. So if you are looking at tables, make sure they're not too highly glossed. Um, um, any metal surfaces should be, um, shouldn't have too much shine, obviously, because you don't want reflection to, to be bouncing into your image. Um, avoid yellow and orange toned wood, uh, pine. Um, a lot of restaurants, um, whenever I'm doing a, a location shoot, I always need to double check um, the restaurant tables because Orange and yellow wood just really fights with a lot of food um, because a lot of food is actually that sort of, those sort of colors. And um, you can end up becoming very overwhelmed with your, back, with your background, um, you know, and you can lose your food in your background. So, and, and I just don't think that an orange or a yellow background really, unless it's on purpose, um, I don't think it should be used. <coughs> um, Cool and natural colors are easier when learning. So your grays, your marbles, your French blues, pretty much um, you can, again, like your, like your texture backgrounds, you can, put, you can put something on there and they can look beautiful um, and just simply, uh, just stand out simply against those colors. And then for me, I like real, real is best. I like wooden planks that I go to the scrap yard and I get from um, a reclaimed timber yard. And I put them onto trestle legs, like I've got here. So these are beans that were that came from the timber yard. I got them to cut them up into one meter lengths. I push them together, and it just looks like a country table. Um, they're on trestle legs that I just bought from IKEA, and um, yeah, so I just basically have a table. It also makes it easier for putting away because those those planks are really really heavy, so um, it's easier just to. Just, just to have them individual so you can stack them away quite easily and store them quite easily. Um, going into other backgrounds that I use. <clears throat> so besides wooden planks, um, fabric, you can get, uh, you can just buy scrap fabric from fabric stores and use them as backgrounds. Uh, vinyl, uh, vinyl backgrounds are really popular. Um, this image that was, was actually taken on a vinyl background. Um, there are a number of um, online vendors who do sell vinyl backgrounds and they're really good because they've got a very realistic look to them and you can wipe them down, you can spill, you can smear honey or whatever you want over it and then you can just wipe it down and roll it up and pack it away. So vinyl is really great because um, it really, it doesn't require a huge amount of storage because trust me, you can end up really struggling with storage if you end up um, collecting a lot of backdrops. So um, storage is actually really important. Um, marble or tiles that you can get from um, a DIY or a hardware store. Um, you can just go and buy samples and um, photograph directly of those. Slate tiles are also really popular. So printed backgrounds like the vinyls, you can buy 
printed backgrounds. Um, you can buy them on photo boards and um, and 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 vinyls. So um, so yeah, there are. I'll show you a slide next if you want to jot down some of the online vendors that you can buy them from. Um, paper. I use a number of different types of paper. Gift wrap. Um, I've got a really cute little. Um, art store just around the corner and they've got beautiful hand painted gift wrap and I often buy gift wrap and I use that as a background. Um, newsprint, very popular as well, also really good. Just try not, try not to have too much uh, background color in it because it can then take away from your um, subject. I like to use um, sort of the stocks and shares section which doesn't have too many pictures in but more print. Um, you can also find online, you can buy vintage or antique newspapers those are really lovely because they don't have a lot of pictures. they mainly font, which, and then obviously you've got the beautiful um, antique look that goes with them. And then baking parchment is really, is really great as well. So if you can, you know, you can buy white or you can buy brown baking parchment. So depending on the color that you want as a background. And then the other thing that's really popular with food photographers is um, a good old metal baking tray. And the older and rustier and crustier they are, the better. So um, ideally, you would like a baking tray that comes from maybe a bake a bakery. That's those really large baking trays. They are very hard to come by. I do need to warn you. And they can, um, if you do find them online, they can be rather expensive. So um, if you know anybody in the food industry who might have a couple of dirty old baking trays that they're prepared to throw out, grab them because that's exactly what you want. Um, so these are the online vendors that I uh, have used. Um, some of my backgrounds have come from. Um, I just have a note there to say that I'm not affiliate of any of these products. I just um, really like all these products and I, and I use them. So Capture by Lucy is the, um, the vinyl online store. She's got a, a massive selection of different types of backgrounds. So she's got wooden backgrounds, marble backgrounds, paper backgrounds, anything you can think of. She has... Um, a range of different colors. She's got a really, really large selection. And um, most of my books I shoot using her backgrounds because they're quick and easy to set up, roll out, roll back up and move on to the next recipe. Um, photoboards.org, I also do have a number of photo boards. They are also printed um, very similar to uh, the vinyls, but they're actually on a board and um, it's a solid board and you can um, you know, set that up. So you can actually stand it up if you want to use it as a background, as a, as a vertical background as well. Um, MyLucy.com, uh, Lucy is actually a very good friend of mine and she's a food photographer herself. But what she's done is she has some really good quality high res images on her website. Um, she's Dutch and you can purchase them for about seven euros off her website. And then you download the image and then you can print them. You can send them through to Vistaprint and you can print out the size that you want. Um, you just print it on a vinyl backdrop um, or a banner backdrop um, through Vistaprint and you can really kind of get the size that you want. Um, and then foodifancy.com, they do solid wooden chipboard backgrounds. Um, they're hand painted, they've been treated, so they're solid and, um, you know, those also, they're really big, they're really heavy, but they are really beautiful quality. So just a number of different backgrounds that you can use. Um, if you, you know, if you're looking to purchase something. So getting into props, um, this is the thing that I'm, that I, that I'm always asked about when, um, whenever I do workshops and whenever I meet people, they always say they never have enough props. And I think this is one of, this is one of the side effects of, uh, of food photography is we just have this, we have this thing that we have to collect props all the time. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's addictive. So um, when, when choosing your props, don't always try and stick to the same size, to the same style. Try and find a variation of different sizes, colors, styles, stuff that you probably wouldn't normally use if you were serving at a dinner party or at a, at a get together. You know, sometimes you have to choose things that are not exactly what you would normally have, but um, they would work well in a really good picture. So, um, so, do, so do keep your mind open when you're looking to, to buy um, props. Side plates fit better into a scene, rather a side plate, smaller rather than larger. So you, um, so you would style the side plate to look like a normal plate, but it just fits better into a scene, especially if you're using sort of an 85 mil camera, uh, 85 mil lens, um, a, si a full size plate can be a little bit big. So rather style onto a side plate instead. 
Um, so whenever I'm, whenever I'm purchasing props, I'll always rather look at the side plates than, than a full plate. In fact, a full size plate I would use, I would style as a platter. So if I was serving a big salad, it would actually rather be on a, on a, on a regular size dinner plate. <clears throat> make sure that your props make sense and that they culturally are accurate. Um, I have seen in, I have seen cases where props um, people have just put props into a picture just because it's a prop, um, and you know just for instance it could be a curry shot with a teapot in the background. You know just make sure that the props actually make sense, and for instance it does really need to be culturally culturally correct um, accurate. So if you are doing a say for instance a Thai curry. You wouldn't put chopsticks with that. Thai curry doesn't, isn't served with chopsticks. So you need to make sure that you are matching it up correctly. Um, matte finishes don't reflect. So um, I really, I like to find um, in the camping sections of sort of Sainsbury's and some of these, some stores, you can find the plastic, the melamine um, uh, plates, you know, sort of, sort of things for picnics. They work really well. They don't reflect and they have a matte finish um, and they are, they're easy to store away. Um, cheap is great. Definitely go down to your, go and keep your charity stores going. I regularly pop into my charity stores to a quick, quick run through of all the homeware and see what props I can buy. But at the same time, it's also good to invest in a couple of statement pieces that maybe somebody else wouldn't have. Um, and, um, you know, that can, that can become a signature for you as well. Um, natural colors allow the food to stand out. But that being said, um, you know, bright colors do have a place. Um, but I think if you are starting to build up a prop cupboard, I would recommend that you just try and look for your natural colors. So your blues, your grays, your greens, um, pinks, those sort of colors really work well. Along with the props, uh, you need to look into um, cutlery and fabric. And cutlery should match the size of the plate. So um, for instance, I've got I don't know if you can see. So I've got a plate here. This is a side plate. So if I'm going to be if I'm going to be setting up a side plate, I can't have a large knife and fork. It's going to be too big on the plate. So you need to make sure when you're looking for cutlery that you look for smaller size cutlery as well. That's going to match the size of your plate. So if you are using a smaller plate, you need to make sure that you find smaller cutlery as well. Um, fabrics add great texture and leading lines to your images. Um, I love to use fabrics. I, I think that also enhance the light as well. Um, so, um, so I use a lot of muslin, which I dye myself. I just buy the dye-on dyes in the, in the hardware store and I mix them up, create a whole big witch's brew of different colors and I dye the, and I dye the muslins. Um, I love these because um, they add creases, which really show the light um, and um, sort of um, contrast. But not only that, they also stay where I put them. So they allow for proper placement. So if I want to scrunch it up and have different heights, um, they'll, they allow that. So a softer fabric will generally just sort of puddle away. Um, so I like to use muslins or cheesecloths. And then if you are using a tablecloth, um, you are shooting a table scene, always make sure that your table that your tablecloths are ironed so that you get all the creases so that they're really nice and flat and they don't have the sort of fold creases in them. Um, Glassware, varying heights and shapes. Um, I have different glasses that I use. And I like to, I purchase, I like to purchase glasses that have a little bit of detail to them, just because you can see here, um, just because it just takes the guesswork out of, out of reflections. Um, that being said, I do like reflections on glasses. I think it adds a lot of natural look um, and it, 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 it's, it, keeps it more kind of realistic, but um, it it's, doesn't show too much of what's going on outside of the scene. So, um, so if you do have, um, if you are looking for glasses, rather try and find something that's got um, a little bit of detailing to it. And, the, and on that note, just always make sure that your glasses are clean. Um, the first thing that you notice once you've done your shoot is you've got a big fingerprint or dirty glass. So um, really important to make sure that um, everything is clean. But that being said, and I have to really stress this, having loads of props will not automatically make you a better photographer. Um, I get this all the time in my workshops that uh, people don't have props and you know they've got to build up their prop collection before they can actually start photographing. And that's, that's 
that's not true. You really, you can start photographing with one or two backgrounds and one or two props. So you don't need to have a lot of props to become a better photographer. Um, Angela, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Oh, good. We have a few. So, uh, Nancy asked, do you ever use reclamation yards to source backgrounds? Yes. yes. Yeah. So I get timber from reclam rec reclamation yards. Um, my my um, wooden beams were from the reclamation yard. I get scaffolding planks that um, I get them to chop up for me into different sizes. Yeah, I, I'm always there. Old doors, I love all of those things. Yeah, for sure. Actually, one thing that struck me about your using the planks that you chop up into uh, lengths is it means you can rearrange them as well, can't you? Yes. So you don't always have the same knot showing next to the other knot. Yes, yes. And you can get you can stack them at varying heights as well. It, it does make it so much easier. And then, like I said, it's easier to store. And some of them are really heavy. I mean, even the scaffolding planks are really, really heavy. So if they were all together, you know, if you have four planks together, it would be impossible to move around. So yeah, yeah it does make That's it easier. Okay, uh, Fiona has asked: Is it always best to use natural light? Do you ever use flash on or off camera? No, definitely not on camera. Definitely, that's, that's absolutely no. Um, and I'll get into light next, um, and okay. I, you'll see why um, you don't use um, on-camera flash. I don't use artificial light for my work besides the, Neo, the Rotor Light Neo 2, um, which I just really use to, to bring out the highlights in certain parts of my images. But otherwise, I, do, I use natural light. Um, I just started using natural light. I'm not a technical photographer, so... For me, I picked up a camera and started to photograph and I just found, you know, felt my way through using a camera. So I was just using natural light. I knew nothing about it, but that's just how I started and that's just how I learned. So I've sort of stuck to the natural light um, and then, yeah, basically I've just started to incorporate um, the rotor light, but on a continuous setting. So, yeah. um, so that I can just see when I'm setting up, I can see where my shadows are. I can see exactly what I'm going to be, what my, what, you know, how my setup's looking with, with that light, with a continuous light. Okay. Um, Anila asked, do you always shoot wider so you can crop or do you shoot, you know, as you, as you want the image to be? Um, it depends what it is. Uh, but generally, yeah, I mean, I'll shoot wider, especially for an overhead shot. I'll shoot wider. It gives me a lot more leeway to fiddle around with the sizing of it. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, if it's a if it's a portrait, if it's food portraiture, then um, very seldom I'll yeah I might crop into it sometimes, but um, you know if I if I want to cut out something in the background, but yeah, I think with the eighty five mil um, when I'm doing straight on, the, it doesn't really give me too much room for cropping unless it's required by publishers. Okay, uh, Rebecca has asked, thinking about your Star and East picture, what uh, aperture did you use for that? Do you remember? Because it was shot with a macro lens. So that's yes. specifically why she's interested. Don't remember, but it would have been quite small. Um, I mean, it would have been quite, it would have been quite wide um, right. because because the star anise is quite small, and I really wanted to get the bokeh on the on the lights in the background. So, um, so because of that, my because it was such a small focal area that I needed, I think it would have been a, quite a wide setting. Right. Okay. Um, Oh, Kim is asking what kind of composition rules do you use, but are you coming to that? I'm coming to that now, right. yeah. yeah. Okay, so we'll come back so. to that. Then I've got some more questions here. Francesca has asked, um, she's assuming that your settings, you're talking about a full frame camera? Yes, yeah, okay. full frame camera. So yeah, so obviously your lenses that, you, that we're looking at, if you're using a crop sensor, you would have to, I would suggest go 35, 50, and then the 105 but you're then going to need more space for yeah. you going to need further distance away. So again, you need to make sure you've got um, room space to move back. Okay. And the images that you've shown so far, are they all with natural light or some with yes. rotor light as well? All, all with natural light. Uh, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe one or two will have, will be with rotor light, but mm -hmm. I've started using, I started using rotor light about eight months ago. So only my sort of my current work has, is with rotor light and you probably can't tell the difference. Um, yeah. Really, it's just, I'll use the rotor light if I'm doing a pouring shot and I want to get the light into the motion so that I can actually really bring out the highlights in a motion shot. But, yeah. but even for instance, like the flower shot that I, the sifting flower shot, that was just, that was all natural light. 
it was 6 a.m. in the morning and it was just pure sunlight shining through there. So, um, so it was just the position I was standing in at that time. <clears throat> but yeah, the idea is to get as much light into a motion shot as possible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then another question, uh, what about using <coughs> a 135 mil lens for flatness and close up detail? A 135 mil or a 35 yeah. mil? A 135. Um, I don't 135. know. I've never used. I've, I've never used one. I mean, uh, it would mean going further back, wouldn't it? Basically. Yeah, and I mean, even even the 85 is quite close. So I definitely mm. wouldn't use the 105 um, for an overhead for a flat lay. You'd have to be really high up to try, and um, unless you were trying to get a macro shot from an overhead position. But um, yeah, you would need you you generally need um, you generally need a smaller lens. For, for an overhead flat lay. Okay, well she said flatness, so I don't know if she means uh, flat lay or um, perhaps, uh, you know, the compression or restriction yeah. of the field, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure if she's got one play around with it, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I yeah. think if it's a 135 macro lens, which yeah. I think Sigma uh, used to make one, I'm not, I'm not sure if they still do, um, you would be able to get a lot of detail but you still have yeah. that deeper working distance than you would with a 105. But yeah, I've never used one, so I wouldn't know. Okay. Uh, and then, oh, I think that, yeah, that's it for questions now. Okay. Thank you. So should we carry on? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. So, right, we're going to get into the compos composition and styling now. So some of the things to consider when you are starting with your, with, with your setup is, do you want to make it light and bright or do you want to make it dark and moody? There's so many different aspects to the composition that rely on the style of the, of, of the image that you're choosing. You need to take into consideration the color of the food. Um, you need to always make sure that your food comes first and then your props. Um, I've seen on so many images where all the focus is on the props and, you, and the food gets lost. Remember, you are shooting food. Um, when and dark going close, so that's where your um, your lens will come in. If you want to use, if you cons if you not really sure exactly how you're going to do it, um, put on the macro lens and get on a really good cl um, close up shot. You can do beautiful macro um, food photography. And then just remember that styling starts in the supermarket. So I'm that person that everybody hates in the supermarket. I'm the one who stands and goes through every single every single peach and apple and red paper that's that's there because um everything for me is about um the color the shape how how it looks um and how it's going to fit into my picture so styling starts definitely starts in the supermarket so odd numbers create balance and i think it's the same across the board and a lot of these um a lot of these tips are actually the same across the board in photography in general so you know, three animals in the wild, three slices of toast with avocado on, all the same. Um, your odd numbers just create a, a, a much better balance than even numbers. Um, so bear in mind, one, threes, five, sevens, all good. Um, so when you're styling, you can keep it simple. Um, triangles. So again, I know that this comes up often in regular photography. And it comes up definitely, I apply to my food photography. So on the left, I know you're going to say, Donna, that's not triangles. If you take, um, if you take some time, you'll actually see that there are 10 triangles in that picture. Um, so I started, when I, when I styled that, I started with the, with the soup in the middle, the big bowl in the middle. And I built off triangles off that, made, that first um, soup in the middle. So... Um, you can't see them, you, can't, you don't necessarily see the triangles, but they're there. And then again, when it comes to the actual styling of the food, putting it onto the plate or the placing of the food, triangles again, um, as in this popcorn, you can see, I always, st I, I always style if, it, if I'm doing a bunch of cherries or if I'm doing strawberries or whatever, it will always be with the tip at the top so that you've got, so that you've got a triangle. Negative space, um, also really important. Um, I think a lot of people feel the need to fill a picture with so much stuff. You know, there's a lot of stuff on Instagram and I'm very guilty of it as well, 
um, of heavily styled and heavily propped images. Um, and sometimes just a little bit of negative space is actually just as powerful. So, um, you know, really makes the food stand out and really makes, um, makes it clear what you're trying to show your viewer. So um, don't feel the need or pressure to, to keep adding things into a picture. Sometimes you can actually take it away, take them away as well. Um, okay, so we're gonna get into some light now. So I love this quote from George Eastman, who was the founder of Kodak. Um, light makes photography. Embrace light, admire light, love it. But above all, know light. Know for all you are worth, and you will know the key to photography. So as I think that was a big turning point for me, was learning about light and learning that um, as long as my lighting's right, you can get anything. I mean, in this previous picture, you can see even eggshells you can make look attractive with 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 good quality light. So um, one directional lighting is always best for food photography. It's the most flattering. So either from behind or from the side is um, is is the way you want to you want to be shooting. Never shoot light straight. Never shoot food with the light coming straight on. Um, Save that for um, portraiture photography, where you want your model to look um, uh, with, you know, smooth and no wrinkles. But with food photography, we want to bring out the wrinkles. We want to show the lines. We want to show the bumps. We want to show all of that. So that's that's what we're looking for. Is we're looking for directional light from either from behind or from the side. Um, find the best window. Um, my advice is to make sure that it's close to the kitchen, uh, so you're not running up and down stairs or you're not running into other rooms with big pots of stew. And also just make sure that you have space to work around that window or the setup. Um, some setups have to move during the year. Sometimes you have to move your window. Well, not actually physically move your window, move to another window. Um, and, you know, sometimes the, year, the, the, the month that you're in can actually make a difference as to where you're shooting in your house. Um, constantly check shadows. So use a diffuser in harsh light and use a reflector to bounce light in low light. Um, the, that's just, uh, you know, um, and you know those um, diffusers where there's the five and one, where you've got the diffuser in the middle and then you've got the foils on the outside, the white and the gold. Never use gold. That's not great for food photography, but white or silver is great for bouncing light. Um, so you can manipulate your light and get it onto your subject. Um, be aware of flash or house lighting. Um, don't, don't let different light sources compete. In my case, I do use a rotor light, um, and I set it to a Kelvin of about um, between 4,800 to 5,600. I won't use it at any um, at, at, at the other at the other ends of the spectrum. So, definitely, if you are going to be using continuous light, then try and be able to get one where you can actually set it to a, to your own Kelvin setting. Um, again, use exposure meter in your camera. Really, really important. Um, and then do the egg test, and I'm going to go into that now. So um, this is the egg test. This is something I teach at all of my workshops, and I always recommend that you take an egg and you walk around to different windows in your house, and you close off curtains, and you close off shutters, and you close off blinds, and you find one window that you're comfortable to shoot in front of. And then, you, then you're going to take your egg, and you're going to look for a shadow on your egg. So the first egg on the left is with the light coming straight on. So you can see it looks plain, it looks boring, it looks, um, there's, there's nothing to it. If you move your light source coming from the right hand side, you can see you get that beautiful shadow that starts to fall across it. And what you're looking for is a soft shadow, that a soft feather shadow that runs um, almost in an ombre from light all the way down to dark. So you're looking for a tonal contrast coming across your, your egg. Then once you can find your egg um, and the shadows in your eggs, then you know that you can do the rest of the setup based on that. So these are examples of um, directional light. So you can see my eggs on the left, my shadow is coming, my shadow is running to the left, my light is coming in. Um, so it's hitting the one side and tapering off into a shadow on the other side. And then drinks always work beautifully with backlight. Um, drinks and a lot of things sort of that, a lot of things that are, that are probably a little bit flatter might have a bit of a shine to them. So some tarts that have sort of a nice shiny, a nice shine to them, maybe sort of a custard tart or something that you want to show off the shine can work really well with backlighting. Um, but drinks, absolutely beautiful with backlighting. Um, and then this is what happens when you have competing light sources. So this is um, an example of, um, 
I was shooting one day and one of my kids walked in and turned the house lights on. And so it, it actually came up in post-production. I didn't actually even see it when I was shooting. Um, it wasn't that obvious. But then when I started to add post-production to it, I started to see that there was a difference in the lighting. So just be careful that, you're, that if you are using artificial lighting, it does match the color tone of the natural light that you're working with. Um, or just stick with natural light, either or. But don't use regular house lighting or in-camera flash. And then learn to see shadows. That is something that I cannot stress enough. And not just when you're shooting, but all the time. Um, I, I, had, I had the story where I was sitting on the bus once and um, there was a bald man in front of me. And I watched, I was fascinated with the back of his head because every time we changed direction, the shadow was moving on his head. And it was just so fascinating watching how the shadows were changing on, on the back of his head. So really important to start looking at shadows. Are they harsh shadows? Are they, are they soft shadows? Are they feathered? Um, you know, just, just, I think for photography in general, just being able to understand shadows and lighting is really, really essential. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, you're on mute. You're muted. That'll make it a lot easier for yeah. you to hear me if I unmute. Fiona has asked, uh, what do you focus on? Is it the nearest point to the lens, the middle or a tip or something? If it's, um, so say for instance, it's a hot dog. Um, I would focus on the point that's nearest to the lens because that's that to me is the, the most comfortable position. If it's say for instance, a popcorn with the, with the, um, the previous picture that I showed with the um, butter being dropped onto it, I would focus on the tip. If I'm doing a motion shot that has um, that something's being poured um, into, I would focus on the point where the two connect. So it would be the tip and where the where the um, whatever you're pouring on. Say, for instance, this flour. If I'm sifting flour, it would be on the tip of the the base of the solid flour, um, and it's where the two of those would actually connect. Um, yeah. That's actually a really great question. And the one thing I, um, I can say is that if you don't know where to, where to focus, just take a moment, close your eyes and count to three and open your eyes. And the first part that you look at on your set, that's, that should be your focal point. Um, always try and work out what your, where your viewer is going to look first. Um, if you, yeah, especially if you're using a very shallow depth of field, you need to make sure that you get your focal points absolutely perfect. That's a really good tip, shutting your eyes and then opening them. Yeah, shut them, okay. open them, and literally the first, part, the first thing you see should be your focal point. Okay. Uh, Shatabda has asked, uh, with the backlighting in the drinks image, how did you set up the dark background? That happens naturally because the light is coming from behind. So that's just naturally. I actually even had to bring that out in post-production. I had to really lift that out in post-production. It was way darker than that. Um, it was a sunny day. It was actually very strong light, um, which, which, was allow, which was enabling the drinks to shine out, but everything else was, was blacked out. So I had to bring that, that out in post-production. So that is just a natural thing with backlighting. Yeah, backlighting is really difficult. It's really complicated to work with. But once you start to play around with it and really start to fiddle around with it, it can be so much fun. You can get so much pleasure out of using backlighting. So was the lighting, if, if these are, this is the top of the glasses, was the lighting coming in like yes. this? Yes, yeah, it's natural so sunlight. 45 degrees and behind rather than yeah. directly. Right. Yeah, so it was natural sunlight from this, actually from this window behind me. Um, and yeah, it was just sun, the sun, it was, I think it was even taken at about 12 o'clock. Um, so yeah, so the sun was coming in at an angle. Okay. Uh, Francesca is asking about the rotor light, the Neo 2. Now I was going to, I've actually got two Neo 2s here, but they're lighting me and I can't take them down. But yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, they're basically a, kind of about that big circular ring of LEDs. And they've got two controllers. One controls the brightness value and the other controls the, um, the te color temperature. And then there's a few special effects and things you can do. But um, so that's a rotor light and they come with different colored gels and, and diffusers and Francesca would like to know if you ever use a diffuser on the rotor lights. Very seldom. Um, when I get wrapped up in, when, when I get wrapped up in shooting, I, I kind of just work with the rotor light. I do use barn doors on my rotor light though. Um, mm -hmm. 
because a lot of the time I don't want the light to shine onto the background. I want to be able to, um, to block off certain parts. So barn doors, um, yeah, uh, you know, I can really close the barn doors down and, and just get a little bit of light coming through that. Um, but otherwise, um, no, not, not regularly. I, w I won't use diffusers. I'll just move it closer or further away from the subject. I guess as you choose a lot of things which are matte rather than shiny, yeah. you're not really worried about getting yeah. the, the reflections. Because sometimes you can, if you've got a very shiny object, you can actually see the individual LEDs, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even I've got an egg shot that I have egg yolk running down. It's one of, the, one of my ones on Instagram, and it's egg yolk running down the front of a book. And um, there were a couple of little spots where I could actually see the rotor light reflecting in the, in the egg yolk. So you still mm -hmm. do have to be careful of that sort of thing. I had to edit those out. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then um, Anila asked another question, which was, oh, do you ever use a wide angle lens? No. 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 Okay. No, not yeah. really. Um, because the sets are actually quite small. You'll see when I go in behind the scenes, you, you know, um, even a 50 mil is too wide for me if I'm using it, um, if I'm using it as a straight on. The sets are not big. They may appear big, but they're actually not. Um, they're really quite small. So even you know, even a, a normal background, a normal vinyl background, they're not really that big. So, um, so no, there's no need for them. Okay, that's it for now then, thank you. Good. Okay, now we're gonna get into the fun part anyway. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna deconstruct this image that I have here. And now you're gonna get to see the behind the scenes kind of setups. So as you can see, I've got the original picture on the left-hand side, so you can keep looking at that for a reference. So as you can see, on the right hand side, this is just the basic, this is just the foundation to, um, to what goes into your picture. You can see my light is coming in from the right hand side, from the window on the right hand side. I have um, a backdrop, which is just held up. Um, those are canvas backdrops that I've painted myself. Um, my shooting surface, which are my four wooden planks from the, um, from the reclamation yard. And then I put black, cardboard down. I would normally have it covering the whole area. I just wanted to show that there are white tiles underneath. Um, I put black card down just in case I take an edge. I, I photograph off the edge of a table. I don't want to have white tiles at the bottom underneath. I'd rather have a black card underneath. So I always just put black cards and um, you know if I if I if I if I want an off the edge image. Um, so we'll go to the next picture which is just which is about adding layers and textures. And this is where um, so the background that I showed you, it wasn't a solid black background. It was slightly mottled and it does start to show through just a little bit. So you can see that there's a background there. It just, it doesn't kind of just disappear. Your table doesn't disappear into infinity. I like to show that there is something in the background. It just adds, for me, it just adds a little bit more um, interest as well. Um, you can see my table surface there. Um, that's shallow depth of field. So it's pushed back. Can't really see too much of it, but you do know it's a wooden table. Um, I'll add fabric on the left hand side, scrunched up fabric so you can actually see the light coming in, you can see the light hitting the fabric, and that also creates a really nice leading line um, from all the way from the back to the front. And then I've got, an, I've got another wooden board. Um, I don't particularly like to just put a plate down onto a table. Um, I like to layer it, add extra layers, so um, I would add a wooden chopping board or I would add um, I sometimes book. There's so many different things that you can add just to just to vary um, your layers. Then we'll get into the colors. So um, this particular this particular board was um, is a piece of a, um, a scaffolding, and it had some art some some builder's paint on it, which was red, which I really liked because it kind of ties in with the pair that I was shooting, um, and then the red rim on the bowl. Um, the rusted edge on the side of the bowl ties in with the rusted board. Um, so there's a connection across the board with, in terms of colors and in terms of style. Um, you've probably never served this to anybody, um, but you know, it just the rustic old look really just works beautifully um, in images. But as I said, it's not something you would serve at, at, a, at a dinner party to anyone. Definitely not on a piece of rusted sca scaffolding. But it, <laughs> <laughs> it works well in pictures. So. That's the thing about food photography. Sometimes, um, you know, what you would, what, you know, if you were served a melted ice cream in a restaurant, you would send it back. But if you see a picture of a melted ice cream, it looks delicious and you want to dive into it. So sometimes it's not exactly as you would see it in a restaurant or you would expect to be served. Um, 
and then our shapes. So we bring our triangles back into this. So, um, so from the, from the pear all the way through to the decanter at the back down to the glass, again, bringing the reds in um, to match the, the color tones of what's going on in the image. So, so yeah, that just shows you the, the setup for, um, for, for that image. Um, I'm going to go into this image and wh what I really want to stress is that something like this, an image like this will take me hours and it's a, it's, it's a matter of moving things in a minute, um, small amounts, moving this forward, moving that back, just to ensure that, um, that everything is in the right place. But you need to understand that this doesn't just happen in 10 minutes. This is a process and um, you can't get flustered. You can't get upset. You can't think that you're not doing it properly because you'll see where this started and you'll see where this ended. And um, so that's where we started. So I had all these different pumpkins and I really wanted to show the different shapes, the different sizes, the different textures that were on these pumpkins. And I didn't really didn't have a clue how I was going to style them. That one, um, that big sort of white one in the back is, was a huge pumpkin and it was flat. Um, it was a beautiful pumpkin, but it was really difficult to try and position. So to, just to show the shape and the size of it. Um, so I went backwards and forwards with the setup, um, which is why I really want to show you that it, it, it's a process. So I love fairy lights. So I wanted to try and throw some fairy lights into this and get a really beautiful soft bokeh going in the background. Uh, but that just didn't work. I didn't want a solid string and I was just battling to try and get that sort of um, romantic feeling with the, um, with the lights in the background. So I chucked them away and I brought in some fake flowers. Um, and I like the fake flowers. They worked, they worked really well with the colors and the tones and the textures of the um, pumpkins, but they weren't grabbing me. And I think that they were too heavy in that position where um, on the left-hand side, it's sort of, I felt that they drew too much attention and that, again, it was the first thing that you looked at. It was the wrong focal point. Um, I, I, I see that I've got a whole load of little brown leaves and I have a suspicion that I probably threw a whole bunch of leaves into it and tried to get a motion shot, which didn't work. So I ended up with a whole bunch of little brown leaves that um, I had to try and clear away. Um, Anyway, so I carried on with the flowers and, um, you know, I played around with a little bit, moved the pumpkins around a little bit, but again, that wasn't grabbing me. And I found that I didn't like going back to the previous one. I didn't like that fabric in the background. I didn't feel that the fabric matched the tone of the, um, the pumpkins. So I got rid of it and I put the, I, I, you know, I thought, okay, well, I'll leave it with a wooden box, but I just felt that that was still a little bit harsh. It was still a little bit unfinished. Wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. So I threw back in the fairy lights because I love fairy lights. Um, and again, they still didn't work. Um, and it's an experiment. Just put it in, take it out, move it, move it left, move it right. But I was determined I was going to get the fairy lights in, which I didn't, but um, I was trying. So then I moved the flowers to the background. Um, again, trying to, um, to you know, take them away from the focal points. And I brought in a new blanket that had some that's got some folds in it and um sort of creates a bit of a flow um but i just felt with this picture there were too many dark gaps between the different pumpkins um and i felt that the again the flowers were drawing so much attention because they were white and then there were these dark gaps between the different pumpkins so that's my final image i broke up the light i broke up the flowers and i created a little bit of a cascade filling in the dark gaps between the different pumpkins and um, allowing the black the the blanket at the back to show to create a leading line um so it wasn't blocked so as you can see it's it does it is a process and it does take time and you've just got to keep playing around and doing things so here are some of the behind the scenes shots um, in my studio so these are the these are the ones that you used in the promo, this picture. And you can see that's the setup. It's not a massive setup. Um, I think this was taken quite late in the afternoon. I really battled with the lighting on this one. Um, I had the silver reflector coming in to, just to bring in as much light as possible. Um, this is, you can see the rotor light in the background in that picture. This is um, infusing lavender water. And I brought the rotor light in at an angle because um, I felt that um, when it was naturally, when, when I was just using natural light, I wasn't getting as much shadow and I wasn't, um, wasn't adding a, a sort of a three-dimensional feeling to, those, to the glasses. So um, I brought the rotor light in and I, and you can see I've got the barn doors on there and um, 
and I again have a reflector trying to trying to get some reflect some extra light in. Um, and those are those are the scaffolding planks that I have. Sorry, Donna, can I ask you a question yes. about that picture? What sure. is the um, what is the uh, stick the pole above? Oh, that's just uh, that's not actually part of the picture. That's just in the background. That's what I normally hang my um, soft backgrounds onto. So oh, I see. Okay. But so that's actually picture. pushed back. Um, yeah, it does look like it's okay. part of the picture, but it's actually just in the background. Um, so this is a this is a um, a, a backlit shot, and I was I was trying to. It's, this is a ginger drink, ginger and honey drink, and I was trying to to do backlighting. But you can see if you if you look at the behind the scenes shot, you can see I've got doors that have a sort of a higher panel, and <clears throat> they were really coming through. Um, I was fiddling around and there, I was just really battling. I was getting some of the green from the background and I, it just wasn't working. And I put the diffuser up to see if I could cut out some light. And then I realized that the diffuser actually made a really great background, gave it that sort of misty feeling to the background. So I ended up using the diffuser in front of the door. Um, and, I, and at the same time, I, still, it, I was still able to get the backlighting coming in um, on that picture. Um, and then this is a recent one that I did for Nikon in our Create Your Life campaign that we did recently, where I was trying to show simple household ingredients that can be photographed um, and you can just turn them into great pictures. And I was really struggling with the light in this picture. And um, I, I just, I, I, because it's such a simple subject, I really wanted to re boost it with beautiful light. And um, it's just nothing was working. And I, I really went around the block and um, I shoot next to this door and my dog started scratching at the door wanting to go out and um, I opened the door to let the dog out and I got this incredible incredibly beautiful shaft of light across the across the slices of bread so that there and immediately was my picture so um, so yeah play around open doors close windows do whatever you need to this is in my dining room, um, on my dining room table, my tripod with my overhead um, in an overhead position. And that was just quite far away from the window so that I could get those nice long um, shadows coming through the, through the egg, through the box. Um, yeah, so I haven't, as you can see, I have a number of different windows that I shoot from. Um, I normally, I sometimes shoot from this window in the morning. And then this pear shot, um, you can see, the pear cake shot you can see how close i actually am to the window in this case it was a very overcast day i think it was in january and um so i set it up really close to the window and then you can see i've got my canvas background pegged to my curtains in the background and then if you look at the bottom right hand image you can see that my background curtains are closed and my blinds on the left are closed but my blinds on the right are open and that is my directional window source that I'm using um, for that picture. And then that was shot with a 105 macro. So you can actually see in that bottom right hand picture how far away my camera is from the actual subject. So that's how far away the camera is from the subject and then on the left is, is what it looks like. So you do need a lot of surface space to be able to shoot with that, cam with that lens. Um, Okay, and then to edit or not to edit, I've seen this debate on she clicks, and it's a debate I think that a lot of um, photographers have. And I know my husband is a is is also a photographer, and he's one of those natural photographers, and he kind of cringes at the thought of editing. But for me, I think editing is absolutely essential. Um, you know, switching to shooting in raw allows the camera to to um, do it allows the sorry, I've got. Um, um, so it allows the camera to, it, it allows you to apply your own saturation, your own sharpening at the levels that you like and what the photo needs. So it's, it's instead of the camera, letting the camera do it for you, you are then able to apply that in post-production afterwards. So I'm a big believer in post-production. Um, okay. So every image needs enhancing, whether it's a big or a small enhancement. Enhancement, um, you know. Even I know my style is quite dark and moody, but um, that happens for me in post production. A lot of the time, it's not shot that way. It's actually it's it's actually brought in through post production. Um, it gives you a chance to per it gives you a second chance to perfect your image. This picture, um, this actually wasn't. I was shooting for a client, and we were topping up this hot chocolate. And um, 
I had I happened to have the camera in my hand and that ended up being my picture. I was able to take out the um, the jug from the top and I was able to highlight that beautiful drop that was hitting the surface of the of, of the hot chocolate. Um, it brings a certain aspect of the image to the viewer's attention. Again, able to cut out the background, bring out the bring out the color and the light in the in the dish, and um, make that my cent my focal point instead of my model on the left hand side being my focal my my not my focal point. You know, the first thing that you look at when you look at the picture. And then it creates an instantly recognizable style as well, which is really important. I think for every photographer, you want people to be able to look at your work and know that immediately that that is your work. And I think through um, bringing in editing skills into your work, um, it does allow for, um, for a pretty recognizable style. So in closing, constantly study light. I mean, I can't, I really can't stress that enough. Um, it's really so important. Surround yourself with food. Um, surround, you know, Pinterest, Instagram. Follow, um, follow food bloggers. Follow um, food photographers on Instagram. Um, the Waitrose magazine is a great source of inspiration. Recipe books, food magazines, anything. You know, just surround yourself with beautiful food images and use them as inspiration. You know, I mean, I know that there's this feeling that you could end up copying. I have no, I have no issue if people try and copy my work, and I have a lot of people who tag me on images that I've done that they've tried to recreate at home, and I love that. I'm very happy with that. Um, I like it that people get inspired by other photographers' work. So for me, that's that's one way of learning. Um, learn to shoot in raw for sure and on manual, really important, um, so that you can then go in and edit and like that back, like that. Um, backlit drinks shot. Um, I was able to really save that that picture by uh, because I shot it in raw and I was able to reduce the reduce the darkness on that. Um, planning is absolutely essential for a shoot. So I always need to make sure that I have extra ingredients. I have fresh ingredients because if stuff starts to wilt, if stuff starts to melt, then I'm able to top it up with something fresh. Um, buy props when you see them. Big, big mistake is to walk away saying, I think I'll get it next time I'm in the shop because they're never there. So buy them when you see them. Um, play around with breaking the rules. It's how you create a unique style. You know, break, try and break the rules in a good way. You don't have to take anything that I've said today um, into practice. Just even if you find your own unique style, just try and, try and change what everybody else is doing. Photograph daily, really important. That's, I think that's where, where my style and um, my, my um, abilities increased was through daily photographing. And even if it's just raw ingredients, it can be an egg, it can be um, something that you bought from the market, it can be a piece of bread. Just try and photograph daily so that you can learn as much as possible. Never feel intimidated or overwhelmed by other success. It's a big thing. You know, when you're seeing what other people are doing on Instagram and on, on social media, you know, that can be quite intimidating and you can actually be quite nervous about trying to share stuff, um, particularly in Facebook groups, you know, also get your stuff out there so that you can, um, so that you can really start to develop a name. Find a way to receive constructive criticism, which I find through my camera club. I love um, my camera club because we get to, you know, um, work is judged and you get really, really good feedback. And not only my, the feedback on my work, but I grow learning from the feedback that other photographers get on their work because it's whatever, whatever the feedback is still applies to food photography. Um, so really important to get constructive criticism, not from family and friends because they're all going to love your work. You really need someone who knows what they're doing who's able to give you proper constructive criticism. Definitely learn post-production. Um, I'm not talking about manipulating pictures. I'm not talking about taking stuff out and um, adding things in and doing that sort of thing. I'm talking about basic enhancing. As a group of women, you know, you wouldn't leave that. Uh, you know, it's it's like it's it's just like adding makeup, you know, to to your face. Um, it's not. I'm not saying plastic surgery. I'm saying just enhance it with a little bit of makeup. So that to me is what post production or editing is. And then say yes to every opportunity because you just don't know what's around the corner. Opportunities are great. Even if they're scary. Even if they're scary. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Sorry, I did run a little bit over time there. That's all right. We haven't filled the internet yet, so that's okay. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we've got a few more questions. Um, a couple of, two people have asked sort of connected questions. So, um, Suzanne said, do you shoot tethered at all? 
No, I don't. Um, I'm very active around my sets. So I, and I'm really clumsy. So I, already a tripod is a danger for me. So shooting tethered is, is not something that I do. I also, um, I do my editing in my study on um, a proper desktop. So um, I don't want to shoot tethered into a laptop. Um, but I do use um, Nikon have Snapbridge, which is mm -hmm. a remote um, app that you can run everything through. And um, so, so I, I rather run it um, through Wi-Fi, um, through, Snap, through Snapbridge. Um, through my camera. Okay, so are you pinging it to your phone or to your computer? To an iPad. To an iPad. Oh, so, so you get a bigger shot, right. Yeah, so nice. I have a bigger shot so I can see. Um, it's just a larger iPad, yeah. Yeah, and Snapbridge is really clever because it can do it automatically, can't it? it pings it. Yeah, across. and you can adjust so much in the, in the app. You can adjust your aperture, you can adjust your shutter speed, you can adjust everything, all your camera settings through, through the app. Um, because you see a lot of the pictures, I'm actually on the other side of the camera. So, yeah. um, so at least with that, I'm actually able to control it, everything from that side. I can control my focal points. I can control everything from the app um, on the other side of the camera. And particularly when you've got a flat lay image, so your camera's yes. out on, a, yes. on an arm. You know, if you touch it, there's going to be a lot of wobble, isn't there? So if yeah. you're doing it remote. Yeah. So right. if you're doing a remote, that's great. If you have a tilt uh, um, live view screen, you can tilt the live screen up so that you can see what's going on. But mm -hmm. yeah, it is so much easier, especially if you're looking, if you're doing a flat lay, to particularly to see if you've got your line straight, if your camera's um, sitting at an angle, you can pick that up immediately. Okay. Uh, Nancy has asked if you get inspiration from still life paintings. I think um, I do definitely. I mean, I think a lot of my style is very much inspired by the old Dutch um, masters of, of painting. And I think definitely my light source, um, I think my love for dark moody and that sort of soft, um, softer kind of lighting definitely comes from, from um, artists for sure. I actually, in a previous life, I, li I like to call it a previous life. Before I took up photography, I was actually an artist. So, um, so I think having that, you know, having the understanding of lighting and that really does help. Okay. Um, Eileen has asked, she doesn't have a studio, but she puts a board on her stove and then uses the light from the window. But often that light is very harsh and it's just on part of the board. So she's tried to use a whiteboard to bounce some light back on the opposite side. Um, but it doesn't work. And she's just wondering if she should block off the window light and use LED LEDs instead. Well, you could block it out with um, greaseproof paper, greaseproof baking paper, stick that over the window or a, um, or a sheer curtain. You just buy a sort of a sheer voile curtain from the shops and try and put that up over it, try and hang that up over it. Um, yeah, I mean, I would try and diffuse the lighting coming in rather than if you've got, if, if you've got, really nice natural lighting. I would rather just try and diffuse that yeah. um, than, you know, um, than, than trying to fiddle around. But, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's because yeah. for me, I would rather make the, na the natural light work. Yes, because basically you're, you're sort of paying to put extra light into something yeah. and cut yeah. off the natural light. But Especially if you don't have it. If you don't, if, you don't have, if you don't have the artificial lighting and you've got to go out and buy it, Mm. Um, then it becomes which one do you buy in the whole process. Um, you know, rather try and get the natural light to work for you. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, maybe try the egg test that you were talking about, because it does make a big difference whether you're talking about north facing windows or south facing windows, because it's, it's south yeah. facing on a sunny day, you'll get very harsh yeah. sunlight, won't you? Yeah. And you're really looking for, you don't want a very strong hard light, unless mm. that's the style that you're shooting in. But Hard light food photography is, it's, it's very trendy at the moment, but um, in, in, the, in the general picture, publishers and those, those sort of publications are not interested in harsh light. They want soft, feathered, diffused light. Right, okay. Right, let's have a look. There's some more Q&A here. Um, Sharon's asked generally, what size are your setups? But you have shown a couple of examples. Yeah, yeah, they're not big. Um, probably about a meter meter just meter length by uh, not even sure yeah they're not they're really not big they yeah. um yeah my, i mean like i said i get my boards cut in a meter and i have four boards together so it's probably a meter yeah. by just over so half a meter a meter's not yeah. a long table no is it? no it's not big it's not big at all okay um yeah. monica has asked oh she's in the shot um i'm not 100 sure 
which one she's talking about you oh i think it's the one with the bread piled up you said you cut the top slice wonky was that on purpose to yes. add interest yes yeah and um, that's exactly why i mean i really hacked at that piece of, at that poor loaf of bread but um, I, I, I have this thing where I, I, I like people to, I like to make people feel a little bit uncomfortable when they're looking at the picture. I don't want it to be sort of, I didn't want it to be regular sliced bread. I wanted people to look at it and, and exactly that, pick it up and go, oh my word, that first cut, that first loaf is very skewed. So it's not what you would want um, to, be, to be served. But yeah, she picked that up. That's exactly what I wanted. Did you break, bake that loaf? No, I bought it. Right, just one. My wondered. local farm stall. No, no. And that's the beautiful thing is that you don't actually need to be a chef or a cook to be able to do food photography. You can buy a lot of stuff from the supermarket or from the from the farm store and just and shoot it. Okay. So I think asking about the same uh, picture, Sue's asked what the white panel is near the bread. I don't Oh, that would be a um, in the behind the scenes shot. That would be a whiteboard that I just that I've just used to reflect a, to bounce a little bit of extra light onto the shadows because the shadows would have been very harsh. So, um, so I just I use a whiteboard on the other side just to bounce back a little bit of light into the shadows to reduce those the harder shadows. Okay. And that's just a foam board that I got from an Amazon package somewhere along the line that was that had a bit of foam at the top and then I've just put two little clamps on either side and that can just stand up on its own we've popped up with some books okay thank you um Anne has asked if you shoot alone or whether you have an assistant I generally shoot alone but um I do work with an assistant my my oldest daughter who's 22 is my assistant as well so she'll come with me on location shoots she'll be my second shooter if I need a second shooter she also assists me in the kitchen if I'm doing books. Um, she helps in the kitchen. She's my hand model. Um, so, yeah, she's, yeah, she's pretty much my, my mini-me. <laughs> so the, the follow-up question is when you're shooting by yourself, how you trigger <laughs> the shot, but you use your iPads. And I use, I'll actually. either use the iPad or I've set the camera to on a timer setting to 10 shots per timer. So okay. I'll hit the camera, I'll hit the shutter, and I'll go around to the front. I get, a, I get about a minute before the, the camera starts. You get a flashing light, and then it goes solid, and then I know that that's when I can start the sifting, or that's when I can start. Um, and then I get 10 shots per, um, per interval. Okay. Per I guess that's, yeah, that's particularly useful for your movement shots, thinking when you're yes. saying you're the one where you're moving the, the flower. Yeah, yeah. Okay. My, because my movement shots is, my focal point is always on a solid, on a on a on a solid um, point, yeah. so um, so you don't you don't need to worry about trying to adjust focus. Okay, uh, Camilla has asked: Are all food photographers also master chefs and patissiers? No, I answered that question earlier. No, I've actually got a really good friend who doesn't cook at all. Her husband does cooking. Her husband cooks all the food in their house, and she's a really successful food photographer. And um, she runs workshops and all sorts, and she's got people who she knows who can bake for her. Otherwise, she buys from the supermarket, and you know, you just you, she sources it from other places. But no, you don't have to be. Um, if you want to get into the recipe book game and you want to start shooting for publishers, that's a different ball game. You do need to know how to follow recipes, and you do need to know how to turn a recipe into a picture. So that is that is different. But if you just want to shoot food, no, you don't need to be. Okay. Uh, Philip has asked, do you ever shoot handheld? Um, I did when I first started, but I've, I think because I, because I do so much, re so much work for publishers now, um, I pretty much always use a, um, use a tripod purely because when I'm backwards and forwards to the set, I want to know that my cam my camera's in the exact same position. So when I'm moving things around, you know, moving things up or down or a little bit like you saw in my setup, it's backwards and forwards the whole time from the set to the camera. Um, I want to know that, that my camera is always in that same position and shooting handheld, you never guarantee to have that same position. So that for me is much easier. And I can go back to the kitchen. I can get things from the kitchen. I can come back and I can continue shooting. And it's always, it's all set up. It's same focal point, everything is set up. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Trish has asked, do you incorporate color theory while styling or building your shot? Now, I know this is really popular with food photographers, but being self-taught, I never learned color theory. So no, I don't. I kind of just get my, I try, I try and just get everything to tie in or sometimes not to tie in. I mean, sometimes I'll have clashing colors, 
um, again, to make, to make the viewers slightly a little bit more, I don't know if uncomfortable is the right word, but, but uh, just make them stop and have a look. So no, I think color theory for me happens naturally. Again, like I said, I am an artist, so I think I automatically kind of pick that up. But it was something that I didn't learn when I was, when I was, learning, um, when I was learning food photography. But I know that a lot, of, a lot of photographers do work a lot with color theory. Yeah, okay. Um, Kim has asked, what is the best way to get noticed and promote your work? What, uh, where to start when you want uh, to win competitions and even sell your work? Okay, definitely Pink Lady Food Photographer. Um, mm -hmm. That is an incredible platform for food photographers. It's like the Academy Awards of food photography. If you're going to enter one competition, that's the one you need to enter. And you don't need to be a professional food photographer. You don't need to be anything fancy. I wasn't. I was a blogger. And, I, and it was literally the day before the, the um, competition closed, I submitted some images. I really didn't expect to get through to, through, even through to the semifinals, let alone to the finals, let alone even getting a placement. So I think you've just got to put yourself out there. So start an Instagram account, put your name out there, share your images. Um, I think for photography in general, enter the competitions, try and get yourself in, onto a platform where you get noticed. But yeah, very important to just get out there, get your name out there, don't be shy, don't hide behind, um, behind I don't know, different names and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Just get out as much as you possibly can. I think one of the great things about the Pink Lady Food Photographer of the year competition is actually there's lots of different categories as well yes. so if yeah. you're feeling a bit if, if you're a bit stumped you know you look through the categories and it can that can inspire you absolutely and there's some i mean there's uh, incredible categories and generally you'll find something to submit um into one of the categories and submit into a number of different categories as well because every year i mean some of the categories are far more contested than others and um you just don't know the, uh, you know when you're submitting which ones they're going to be so just generally sp spread spread it across. I mean, I've been in the finals for four years in a row and two of my images, if you looked at them, two of my images that were selected for the finals, if you looked at them, you would never know that they were mine because they were, um, the one was of a beach shop in Zanzibar, which was this year. And then another one was, um, oh, it was taken in a at a festival. It was somebody eating ice cream in the rain at a festival. So, so far from what I normally shoot, but because I, because I entered a number of different categories with different styles of photography, I, I was still able to make the finals each year. So, yeah, definitely. It's not all about uh, portrait. And I guess that by looking at those different categories, it stretches you a little bit as well. And it, you, you never know where that might take yeah. you. Yeah, for sure. And, and you do, you have to extend yourself. You have to push yourself. And, and I love the fact that this year I'm in a, I'm in a WhatsApp group with, with a bunch of food photographers and none of them knew that that was my picture. It was only afterwards they said, you know, they texted me and said, wow, we didn't even know that you could do that kind of photography. So you don't want to be too stereo, too typecast into a, a specific style. You know, you do need to get out there and try other styles. Okay. Now, Anne's asked a question, but I think perhaps missed your uh, early slide because she's saying when you say 45 degrees, are you talking vertical or on a tangent? And um, the, the answer is uh, vertical, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of, it's the approach that you would take into, if you were walking towards a dining room, uh, towards a dinner table. You know, it's that sort of not straight on, not from the top, but just at an angle. Okay. Uh, Sharon's asking, what is your inspiration? Or I think perhaps, you know, are there any food photographers that you really recommend following? I, I was initially, when I first started food photography, I was really inspired by Eva Cosmos Flores. She's an incredible photographer. She's based in Portland and Oregon. Mm -hmm. And I, um, right in the very, very beginning, I did a workshop. I was lucky enough to be able to go on a workshop of hers. And um, you can actually see that my style is definitely inspired by Eva. I love Amy Twig from Twig Studio. She's a local um, photographer. Absolutely adore Amy. Um, B, um, B Lubas is a very good friend of mine. Very different style to me, but um, yeah, she also, you know, I think we, we, we work together and we inspire each other, you know, and I think between all of us, we kind of work out what the trends are and, and what's happening. So, okay. yeah. That's great. Maybe um, if you wouldn't mind, you could uh, type a few names into uh, yeah. comments so that people can perhaps follow them on Instagram or something. I'm sure people yeah, would like for that. Sure. Thank you. Um, uh, Charlie has asked, uh, she, uh, if she only has a 50 mil and a 70 to 200, could she use the 70 to 200 for further away shots? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
Because yeah, you, you, you sometimes shoot with the 105, so she could actually yeah, get a bit Yeah, lower. you could go middle. But um, what I would suggest is I always try and say don't use the zoom. Don't move your tripod rather than using the zoom lens. So set your, set your lens at a certain setting and then move mm. your camera backwards and forwards. So, so treat your zoom lens as a fixed lens. Um, you know, because otherwise you can start to get distortion sometimes and it can start to look a bit, sh it, it changes the compression sometimes of your pictures. So rather know exactly what it's going to be and just move your camera closer, further or closer away. Or, yeah. Okay. Uh, Charlie's asked a follow-up question, which was, um, do you ever use any phone apps or your phone when you're setting up um, a new set or trying an idea? phone apps in what I don't know what way I think maybe um to help you visualize something or shoot with a, your your phone just to um, um, get a quick shot when I'm working uh, uh, I, I did um three recipe books for the same author and when I was working on that I would photograph with my phone and I would just whatsapp it straight through to her um so she had an idea of what was happening and she could give me her opinions but no otherwise I get so in the zone when I'm setting up that I, I do very little outside. I mean, people can't even speak to me sometimes. I'm so focused on what I'm doing. So no, um, no, I don't, I don't really kind of, I, I don't, I don't even have my phone anywhere near me when I'm setting up. I'm so into focused on what I'm doing. Okay. Um, I forget who wrote it, who asked the question, but I wrote it down and someone's actually asked, uh, which camera do you use? I use a Nikon Z7. I'm shooting with a Nikon Z7 at the moment. I also have um, a Nikon D850, which I, which um, Gemma uses as um, as my second shooter when we when we're on location or when we're doing other things. Okay. So, do you think is is the mirrorless a good move for you for as a food photographer? I love the mirrorless. I absolutely love the mirrorless. Um, because I'm a non-technical photographer and I'm, and I, and I'm very proud to say that I'm non-technical. I, um, when I'm able to, when I change the settings in the camera and I'm actually able to see them immediately, um, particularly whether it's overexposed or underexposed, that is huge for me. Um, just to be able to, to instantly see at the change of the settings, what the picture is going to look like. So to be able to look yeah. through the viewfinder and know exactly what the picture is going to be, what's, what's happening in the picture is absolutely essential for me. And then the other thing is um, the size of it, because I'm not a particularly big person and I move around a lot. I'm picking the camera up, I'm changing di angles, I'm changing directions, I'm moving the tripods around. You know, shoots can get really physical for me. If I'm working on a book, I'm doing five recipes a day, different camera angles and that kind of, that kind of thing. The weight of the camera makes a difference. It makes a huge difference. Um, so yeah, just the the mirrorless for me, hundred percent, absolutely fantastic. Okay, um, and Sarah, to, sort of switching back to a slightly more technical thing, then um, asked for a reminder of the rotor light settings. I think you you said said the white balance. Um, four thousand eight hundred to five thousand six hundred, okay. generally across the board for food. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, um, Anne James has raised her hand. I'm not sure whether she's done that deliberately um, or accidentally. So, Anne, I'll allow you to talk if you want to gather your thoughts. And um, I just wanted to ask a question, which was, how do you go about, you know, there are some foods you sort of think, oh, I don't really like that. So, for example, I really don't like egg that much. So, so seeing raw egg yolk, I always think, oh. And yeah. I, I don't, it doesn't really appeal to me. So how do you make something appealing that you don't particularly like? Well, I mean, obviously, if, if I'm shooting it, if it's for my own personal um, portfolio, I, I, I wouldn't shoot it. Um, right. I like to shoot pretty food that's, that really sort of stands out and has a little bit of oomph. But when I'm shooting recipes for other authors, um, there's a lot of food that I, that, I can't, that I can't stand. I'm not big on seafood and I'm not big on fish. And um, you, you've got to make it work. You've got, to, you know, I have to respect the fact that this is an author and that they put a lot of effort into their recipes and I've got to make, I've got to put my personal opinions aside and I've got to make it work. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, the one thing I have found is that if I've been really ill, if I've had sort of a, a stomach bag or something, you just can't shoot on a day like that. You've just got to put the camera down and go to bed because you're yeah. not going to do that, that food any justice. If you're not feeling well, if you can't stand the smell of it, if you can't stand the sight of it, put your camera away and save it for another day. That must be quite hard with fish then. Because it's yeah. quite smelly if you don't like it. 
Especially <laughs> when sometimes it's eight o'clock in the morning and you've got fried fish or something. Yeah. Yeah. You know, hmm. um, can be quite can be quite interesting but you know again like i said sometimes i just get so focused that i actually forget you know i don't always get the smells my husband works from home so he has to deal with all the smells the cooking smells <laughs> oh there must be times when he's thinking oh i'm looking forward to dinner and then gets very disappointed <laughs> no, no, no he starts at lunch and he wants to know what's for lunch <laughs> Okay. But that's the other thing I need to say is that all of my food is real. All of my food is 100% real and edible. Um, and that's what I think a lot of people um, think about food photography. It's, it's fake and it's been, you know, it's, it's, yeah, there's, it's for me, I know that that happens in the industry. I think it happens on a commercial level just to reduce costs and time. But mm -hmm. for me, everything is real, even down to my ice cubes. So, right. Okay, uh, we've got someone else who'd like to ask a question. So Sue, if you want to unmute yourself, you should be able to ask a question directly. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. can. Thank you. Excellent. Hello, hi Donna. And hi, hi Sue. Hey, and thanks for a great presentation. Um, I just have one question quickly. So it's the photo of the bread um, on your presentation. There was a small little, I'm not sure what it was. Is it, is it a reflector? It was right beside the bread. It was white. Oh, just... it was a bread knife. It, it was standing up. Oh, yeah, that is, uh, so, so the behind the scenes shot, that would have been a, a, a white bounce card. Bounce. So, so it's, it's, a, it's just a white piece of foam that I would put, that I put to bounce the shadows back um, to just to reduce the shadows on the left hand side. My light source would have, my light would have been coming in from the right hand side. I'd put a bounce card on the left side because my shadows were just a little bit too strong. So to reduce the shadows, I just put a bit of white. If I really want to bring in extra light, I'll put silver. Um, but white is, white just adds a subtle, um, lifts the shadows subtly. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's Pleasure. all. Thank you again. Pleasure. Thank you. Um, we have a qu one more question from Facebook, which is from Jane. She says she's been asked to shoot some dishes in a dark cafe for a favor for a business that suffered during the uh, lockdown. And should she get the dishes and shoot them in a different location? I prefer to do that. Um, you know, whenever I'm dealing with clients, they'll always tell me that they've got big, beautiful light windows. And then I get there and I find it's a tiny little window with not enough, with not enough light. So I prefer to control the lighting myself from home. Um, if they want the background and they want the whole sort of atmosphere of the restaurant or the venue, that's a whole different story. But if it's just food, I would recommend that you do it from home where you're in a, where you're in a comfortable environment. The other thing with shooting on location, is particularly in a restaurant that's busy, um, your tripod gets in the way, your reflectors get in the way, um, and customers get in the way. <laughs> um, so unless you have a quiet spot that you can set up somewhere. So I will always go and do a location scout before I agree to shoot in a on, a on a location. Otherwise, yeah, they must um, bring the food to, to you and shoot it at home in a controlled environment. Okay, thank you for that. That makes sense. Uh, right, so I will make this the last question. It's from um, Eileen, and she said, do you use holders to keep food things in place? Holders? Well, I guess, you know, would you use cocktail sticks perhaps to... Oh, hold? yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that kind of thing I'll use. I'll use little sponge makeup, you know, those little triangle makeup sponge applicators. I'll use those to prop up pages so that you can get a nice page that's standing mm -hmm. up. Um, yeah, I use toothpicks if I need to prop things up, um, wipe things down with an, an earbud. You know, I've got a whole stylus kit that I have that, um, you know, kind of just goes into propping and holding stuff up. I mean, that's as far as I'll go in non-realist and non-edible things. Um, but again, once they're removed, you can still eat it. So, um, so, so yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if I'm particularly if you're doing a hamburger, it's good to try and keep everything in the um, held together with toothpicks so it doesn't slide and kind of yeah. fall apart. Yeah, okay. that's great. Thank you very much. Well, um, it was great because we were able to stream this on Facebook Live, so a few people who weren't able to join were able to see it uh, live, and we've had lots of people watching here today, Excellent. and everyone's really grateful for you sharing all your knowledge and inspiration. I think oh, people okay. particularly enjoyed seeing your behind the scenes and also how you built the set because you know it, it really helps to visualize. Yes, you know, absolutely. See some, 
fantastic images but it's hard to imagine how they were put together so that's very generous of you to to let thank people you. see that and thank everything you. that i've done in my home other people can do in their homes you know you what i really want to get across is you don't need a professional studio to be able to do this so you know go out and shoot and conquer go for it great well, i think that's brilliant advice and like you said uh say yes to every opportunity absolutely absolutely